My name is Daniel Pitty. I'm Associate Director of the Institute for Advanced Technology in the Humanities. And my colleague to the right over here is Brian Tingle from the California Digital Library. And what we're going to talk about is social networks and archival context, which is currently a project, but I'm going to discuss a little bit about trying to turn it into an ongoing program from R&D to, to a, a real program. And the way we're going to go about discussing it this afternoon is I'm going to talk about context and overview for, for snack, as we call it, and uh, a bit about the research and demonstration uh, phase of it. And then I'm going to turn it over to Brian to talk about the history research tool, which is part of the research and demonstration component as well. But it's, it's actually the more interesting part of what you'll, you'll see today, I hope. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, where we are with respect to turning what we're doing into a cooperative program. Um, if, if I was assured that all of you were archivists, I, I wouldn't do the following couple of slides, or I, I might anyway. And, insult the intelligence of most people, but I think it's safe. It's, it's good to sort of tell people what archival records are. Um, so the standard definition of archival records uh, is that uh, the, the records are the byproducts of people living and working as individuals in organized groups and in families. And Re records frequently are tools, they're utilitarian, they're the things that when we're going about doing our jobs or living our life, they're things that we put together that we use in the process of, of, of doing the things that we do. So if you're building a digital library, it's not the digital library, it's all of the email and discussion notes and everything else that goes into planning it and implementing it and the rest. It tends to be those kinds of documents. And so records necessarily then document people living and, and working. And then since we exist in, in social, professional, intellectual contexts, we know people here and now today, we interact professionally, we have family relations, et cetera, but we also have intellectual relations. There's lots of people that we read that we've never met socially, but they still have an impact on us. And sometimes these people are long dead. So that falls into the, the context of, of, of who we are. And the records document that interaction among us as social animals. So the way archivists go about describing records and the way they've done so traditionally is, is uh, they describe records in context. They may not always have called it that, but we will soon make records in context, not this project, but something else I'm involved in. Records in context will become, I think, a ubiquitous, ubiquitous way of describing how archivists do their describing. And at the core of it is the principle of provenance, which is to say, you know, all the records that Daniel P. creates over the course of his lifetime, that those are all kept together, and they're described together, and one attempts to maintain the original order of them, which is not necessarily its physical order, but it's the logical order or an interrelation they have to one another with respect to how they interconnect and are used by me. And then uh, they also describe the context. So you describe a bit about 
uh, uh, if someone were to describe my records, they'd say something about me so you would understand who I was, what the pr professional activities I gazed, engaged in, etc., in order to understand those records. Archival descriptive practice uh, to date, and it's, it's likely to remain dominated in this way, is, is a single apparatus called a finding aid. These things are pretty long and they describe all of the records that are kept together for one creator. Uh, in, in one document and they start by describing the whole and then descend in describing parts of the whole and only rarely do they actually get down to item level description. That's, that's more the exception than the rule and, and in part that's because of economics, the economy of it, but it's also because if you've described everything at the item level, you, you, you lose the context within which those records sit. And you, if you lose that context, you lose sense, the sense of what the records mean. And in this description, in this single apparatus, they describe the creators of them, as I mentioned a moment again, a bit of biographical information, the name, what occupation or occupations they had, etc. And then many of the people documented in the records, which is to say not the creator of those records, but people that the creator interacted with in one way or another, are also documented in those records. So these records become really primary evidence of sort of understanding the social networks within which people exist and the primary evidence of what that social network was. And so I, I've come to think, and I, and I borrow the, this hyphenated term, social document network, I've borrowed it from Alan Liu, this uh, English professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, who's very much interested in historical social networks, but also their connection to contemporary social networks, and the way in which we're bound up together uh, through the documentary evidence as well. So archives represent a vast social document network connecting the past to the present to the future. If I had connected to sound, that's when you'd have some sort of soaring music to go with this. I should have said it more dramatically in order to evoke chills or something along these lines. Uh, so what we've said about doing, and I'll describe what we're, we're doing in a moment. We started in 2010 with funding from NEH. Um, and then overlapping that, we got money from IMLS. The fir first part was R&D from NEH. IMLS was more on the, the planning side. We were already beginning to think about how can we transition this to a cooperative program. And then additional money from the Mellon Foundation, both for the R&D and also for additional planning. And the partners in this uh, are the U.S. National Archives and Records Administration, the University of Virginia, uh, IETH, University of California, Berkeley, School of Information, and the California Digital Library. And again, two complementary activities, research and demonstration and cooperative planning. So the, the R&D objectives, um, to demonstrate that data describing people existing in archival descriptions, so what's embedded in these monolithic descriptions can be extracted out. Um, so we can, we can take this existing data and we can use it to address the challenge of finding, discovering, locating, and understanding distributed historical resources. And at the same time, we're also, it wasn't an initial 
purpose, but it arose as a purpose once we saw what the results were, was to lay the foundation for an international cooperative for centrally maintaining this data that we had extracted out and interrelated and reconfigured. So for the R&D, we had uh, 2.2 million WorldCat archival descriptions, archival description being loosely defined because there's no precise way of getting these out of MARC records. So some of the things you'll find in SNAC are in fact not strictly speaking archival, but they hover around the edges. Nearly 190,000 EAD encoded finding aids, primarily from the US and UK, mostly from the US, about 30,000 from the UK, and, and a handful from the French for experimental purposes, from the BNF and the CCFR, which is a, a, a national um, run by the, the, the BNF for the academic research archives in, in France. And then 300,000 British Library authority records that are associated with the manuscript collections of the British Library dating back to before the Common Era. And NARA authority records, we have agent descriptions from the Smithsonian Institution archives and the New York State archives and uh, a variety of other things as well, but that's the, the bulk of the data. And so what are we doing in the R&D? Uh, is uh, extract data out of those monolithic descriptions uh, or in a symbol or migrate that data into encoded archival contexts, corporate bodies, persons, and families, which is an archival communication standard. And so we're using all of that data I just described a moment ago as source for this. Then once we have those CPF records, we match them against one another, although that, that's not quite true. That's not, hasn't really happened because they've primarily been matched against existing authority records in the virtual international authority file. And from VF, we enhance the descriptions that we have with normalized entries that have been gathered around, adding alternative entries and titles from VF, and also picking up some links to Wikipedia, uh, WorldCat identities, and, and uh, other sources. And then finally, and this is the part that Brian will describe, is, is we're creating a prototype historical resource and access system. It's a resource because it's full of biographical information. You could just go there for that. But, and it's an access system because it also provides integrated access to all of the archival descriptions that we used as sources to extract these names out. So, you know, the, the primary challenge in all of this from a technical point of view, I, I mean, at, at the, at the uh, back end of this, at the extract a symbol, there's lots of challenges. And, and Brian can describe the lots of challenges at, at, at for the, the prototype research tool, but, but one of the big ones in between is, is the challenge that, you know, we, we pull out names and there are different names for the same person and different people with the same names. It becomes the issue of identity, which ultimately becomes a, a rather profound epistemological challenge. It's most certainly a challenge for computers, and it's a challenge for people. And a lot of times, it's really a challenge because of the sparseness of the available evidence, because name strings in and of themselves are weak identifiers. Um, so in the original, what we, in that first, 
part of the process, we extracted out uh, 6.3 million CPF records, so describing persons, corporate bodies, and families, the bulk of those being persons, corporate bodies lagging behind, and families, a fairly small number. And then after the merge processing up against v, uh, the VF records, about 3.5 million, but this is slightly out of date because we're still loading these things through and what Brian's going to show you a number that has that up to about 3.6 million at this point. So it's a whole lot of them. And so over to Brian, and while I'm switching over for Brian, uh, what was it I was going to say? Um, yeah, I'll eat it. <laughs> All right. I won't say it. Brian's there now. Uh, yeah, I don't know how an acrobat is it under view. Where do you get to? Uh, Full screen, and it's under view, I believe. View. Full screen, all right. Hello. Um, if you want to follow along on, at home or on your phone, um, you can not actually view the site if you like Google Snack. Uh, you could get to it if you don't want to type this big URL in. How many people have you, did people see the first version of Snack? So a few people, have people seen the second version of Snack? So okay, so you've seen where it changed somewhat. Um, uh, this is a home page of Snack. Um, when you go to it, a good fraction of the, well, about one and a half percent of the records we have um, Wikipedia thumbnails for. And so you, that's about 40,000 records. And you come to this page, and you can just sort of refresh and get random samples of records. Um, Doing a search, there's autocomplete against all of the names in there. Um, in the, this page has a lot of, of stuff going on, but we tried to sort of color code it and use icons to hopefully make it easier to under, for a researcher to understand what's going on here. So um, you can see we've got this a person, family, and organization icons. And we use that in this record type column. So hopefully that makes that clear of what they're looking at. Um, some of the records have biographies. Some of the records have Wikipedia links. So we also have limits now on that. So you can drill down to those records. Um, and that's all color coded and icon coded in there. So hopefully it, there's a lot of stuff going on here, but hopefully it makes it easy to to digest. Um, so we've done a search for George Washington. It looks like this first, first one's our guy here. Um, I want to also mention um, we had facets in the old site, but we sort of redesigned how the facets work in this site. And we've added a facet for location. So if you want to try to track down where your records are showing up in the snack site, that's a tool to try to, to see where your records have ended up. Um, so you can do that facet on any search. There's another trick on the site. If you search for nothing, you get everything. So just a blank search will bring you back all the records. And then you can also do the browse from there, you know, if you wanted to look at location or the other browses. Um, and we do have a, a to Z browse of three million records. That just as a list that you can go through. Um, so now, if you go down into a, a record, this this one is a little abnormal because it's got a lot of maybe same as is. Um, normally, that's not taking up so much space, but this is the record where we've merged stuff together from all of these sources. So you, we've got about uh, 2,200 archival collections um, that have some sort of mention of George Washington in them. And this is one of the areas when in the research uh, Rachel Hugh did. Um, this 
she identified as one of the most useful sections to the researcher is these links to the collections. This is somewhere where we still need to do a, a, a lot of work to make that um, really easy to use. When you right now we've got 2,200 here. I think we've got one record where we're going to have 24,000 related collections in the Henry. Is no, that it's 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 30,000 related people in the organization. Okay, the people and organizations are getting, okay. Um, anyway, there's, right now these are just big lists, and so there needs to be some sort of filter on those to make those so that they're, um, with these larger records, that they're really going to be useful to people trying to find stuff. But um, So other things that we pull together into here, um, you can see the, the thumbnail from Wikipedia. Um, that has a link to the right statement. I'll talk about how we pull that in. Um, oh, yes, that's what this is different. Okay, thanks. <laughs> well, what is different about this? Yes. Um, but this, this view, we've popped open the related external links. So um, we have links into archives grid. If there was a hidden DPLA, you could get to Wikipedia and other, you know, other authorities in this section. Um, here's an example. This is 1,700 related names. It's just too much to browse that you just pop on that and it opens up. Um, we are pulling in a lot of alternative names. If you can see back here, there's this alternatives name link. So if you click on that, it does this pop up with all of the alternative names that are coming in from VOF mostly. We've also added this current or collection locations pop up. And this is something too that we've identified is um, could be very helpful for researchers. We don't right now, you see a couple issues here. It's an authority system, but we have no authority on the locations right now. Um, so we've, there's some duplicates and some weird things going on. But then the other thing that we uh, want to do is get the lo actual geographic locations coded for these uh, collection locations. Uh, the idea is that a researcher would want a, to be able to do a map of where their research interests are collected around and use that to help plan a uh, travel grant or something like that. Um, in, see if there's you know geographic clusters of their of their research interest um, there is a the, the graph that we had going on the first snack is now going in the second snack uh, we found that this this graph while it is sort of cool to watch it animate and um, you can click around in there. It's probably not that useful to researchers for a, a variety of reasons. Uh, they want to be able to see uh, sort of color-coded what the relationships are and um, be a little more, uh, uh, be able to do more, more things in it that with this particular uh, JavaScript InfoViz toolkit and the way that this it's working with Canvas makes it really hard to uh, really tweak what's going on with it. Looking at another toolkit that's called viz.js, it's, um, it's a JavaScript version of something, I forget the name of it, that comes from Stanford that uses the dot language. Um, just, uh, shoot, I can't remember the name of it. But this is a JavaScript sort of clone of the same language. The way that it's written um, is much easier to customize. So if we go further into the graph visualization workflow, um, this might be a better toolkit to use than the, this is just viz.js versus infoviz toolkit. <laughs> What's the other one? Another change that came out of the, the user research, um, before in Snack when data was missing, the records sort of looked broken. So we added some really clear, hopefully, placeholders. Um, this, the, the biographical notes are just not available. It's not that you've gotten to a broken record. So hopefully, that's clearer for researchers.
talk a little bit about some statistics. Um, this probably isn't re readable. We've got a sort of a stats page on the index. You can see here we've got uh, 3.6 million records in the index currently. Um, about three and a half percent of those have some sort of have a Wikipedia link that we've pulled in through VIOF. Mm -hmm. And then a fraction of those have uh, thumbnails that we've been able to grab out um, using a Sparkle endpoint. And what else did I want to, oh, it's just sort of interesting here. We, only 83% of the records have a location, and the British Library and Australia and this other, that, that's in uh, Britain too, right? University yeah, of, yeah. so we have a lot of uh, international right there on the top for some reason. We've been keeping Google Analytics on the site since we launched. Um, this is visits per day. So some, somehow in January, we started getting about 1,000 a day, at least one day a week. I don't know what, what happened in January. Um, we still have the old site running. And it's getting almost the same amount of traffic. <laughs> so we have to do something there as far as figuring out how to redirect the old site to the new site or um, and then this is, this is I, I, it's, I found this is really fascinating to me. This is, on the newer site, we enabled um, a Google demographics feature uh, on the analytics. And uh, according to this, over 30% of our users are 65 and, or older. And I, I'm just fascinated by that. What is, like, what is so, it's yeah. It's like Bill O'Reilly's show. That sort of <laughs> makes me nervous. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why most of the hits are coming from Google. Something about what we, the words we have have a great affinity towards searches of um, people in an older demographic. I think Medicare could advertise on our site or ARP or something like that. <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about some of the technical challenges. The, the biggest th thing, we went from 128,000 records to now more than three million records in XTF. XTF is a system that we've been using, we, we developed at CDL and we've been using probably for 12 or 13 years now. It's an integration of Saxon, which is an XSLT engine, and Lucene, which is a search engine. Um, they're pretty closely, tightly integrated. We'll, we'll probably never upgrade Saxon past eight because of the license change between eight and nine. We'll probably not upgrade the Lucene, but it's something that CDL is using in production. We'll probably be using it for another 10 years at least. We're, we're committed to supporting it for our own uses. Um, we're, it's on GitHub now. We accept pull requests. Um, we've gotten a few pull requests from the community of XTF users. Um, there is a snack fork of XTF. The snack fork is pretty much the same as the regular fork except in the XSLT style sheets that uh, are customized for the EAC CPF rather than the generic XTF. And then there were a couple places in XTF where there was like a series of eight nines in the Java code that was sort of hard coded in there. And I had to add a couple of nines to those strings of nines. <laughs> And then I was able to get it to work with a number of records, but I, we would never figure out, Martin, who wrote it, didn't remember what, those, what that number meant, but we just increased that number and it was able to work. And um, we had to add a lot of RAM, too. It takes about 14 gigs of RAM to um, run the uh, Tomcat that XTF is running in. And I think we're about 41 gigs of XML right now that it's indexing. Um, this next column here, I, I put Bauer and Grunt. It's actually Bauer and Middleman that I was using on the front end for this. Um, Bauer is really cool if you've never used it before in front end development. Um, it's a packaging system so that you don't have to pull all of your JavaScript and CSS libraries into your repository. You can just put this list of here's all the libraries I use, and it knows how to go out and grab them and install them. So that 
in the the new snack to make it work too the other one thing i had to do is change it so it only does 20 um requests 20 results at a time and those smaller chunks are coming out in javascript which are feeding into the slick grid which lets you do sort of the infinite scroll of three million records and then uh, Tinkerpop is another um, piece of the stack. Um, it has this thing called Rexter, which is the server uh, that is serving the, the graph visualization. And um, it's what we use to create, a, a, for the first snack, a version of RDF that we published of, of all of the records. And um, yeah, skip the aqua hire. So XTF, just a couple of other notes about how, what, one thing at CDL, we're moving from our data center to Amazon. And as part of that, uh, Martin, who works on XTF, was exploring how to cluster XTF. Um, we don't have a fancy clustering like Solar or Elasticsearch where you can run a lot of instances that sort of shard the index around. But um, he's developed a strategy where we index on NFS, and then the web workers tie into that same index. So that's a, a clustering strategy now that we have in XTF, which we didn't have before. And then I found out another trick that Martin uses that's not in the main XTF, which is something that we're going to need for Snack. Um, Rachel found that the people want to see the updates to come through to the site pretty quickly. And right now, the other XTF sites I've been working on, we do a daily batch reindex. But there's a sort of a queue based mechanism that Martin is using any scholarship that we're going to adapt into Snack. And I'm going to see if that, I mean, that'll become available too, either in the Snack fork or maybe back in the main XTF fork. So that'll, uh, with just the number of files we have, um, the way the indexing works. Takes, takes, takes a long time right now. Um, so the Wikipedia thumbnails, um, I mean, a thumbnail, you might think, well, that's probably fair use. But a lot of the thumbnails, or at least some big fraction of the, of the thumbnails in Wikipedia are under attribution licenses. So I wanted to find a way that we could at least link back to the um, attribution page. And I couldn't get that out of the normal, just sort of RDF dump, but I found I could write a Sparkle query that would grab uh, both the thumbnail link and the link to the attribution URL. So there's a pre-processing step that runs, and it sort of grabs this link data. It's also doing searches like against DPLA to see if there are any hits. And so I, don't know, I was thinking about this pre-processing step and then you know, thinking about this page and all of the different sources of information that need to be updated and kept up to date in there. And I had this um, sort of realization, I guess, there, that this thought that there's, there's sort of two tensions that are related but um, not exactly the same that are going on as we try to think about how um, we keep these pages updated going forward. And one of those tensions is of centralized control versus decentralized control. We heard a little bit about of that in, in Brewster's talk today, I think. And then there's another dimension of people directly editing things versus this idea of sort of this linked data cloud where data sort of uh, cooperates together into this bigger entity. And I think that Snack really has to work in sort of all four of these quadrants. Um, you know, we've got, we've got a lot of different, you know, <laughs> a lot of different philosophies and um, challenges and a lot of data to keep up to date. So I think somewhere we've got sort of all of these quadrants going on of sort of a traditional model, some sort of crowdsourcing, 
pulling data in from linked data sources and being sort of an authoritative source that people can link into. Uh, we do have one, one change between the old first prototype and the second prototype is we do have persistent URLs now for all of the records, which we didn't have in the, in the previous version. So that's just my thought on trying to, some framework for trying to think about these different sort of modalities of, of updating and maintaining the records. Um, mentioned just one little technology piece I've been playing with with this. Uh, Amazon Web Services has something called Amazon Cognito. It is a uh, written originally for people developing iPhone and Android applications so that it would provide a mechanism so that they could use any open ID connect identity provider to authenticate in the app. And then it also provides a syncing service so that the app could sync between your iPhone version and then the user checks it on their Android. They would sync the data back and forth. They, Amazon recently released a version of this that works in JavaScript. And you can actually authenticate with it into, and then give a token to the JavaScript client that can access different Amazon services. And then it can also sync data back and forth. Um, so this demo of logging in. Um, this might be something that is relevant to something like saving book bags for users uh, if they wanted to save a bunch of records and be able to get back to them later. And it's possible that this could play into um, the access controls as far as uh, making the site editable by um, archivist contributors. And um, so we, on the website, the SNAC website, we've got some of the forthcoming features that we're working on. Uh, the long lists of archival things, I think, is the most, most critical, having some way to really work with those lists of 2,000 names. But if you have uh, thoughts of other things uh, that we should be working on, other features that we should have, you notice problems with records, there's a little question mark in the lower corner of every page, and you can go on there and send us feedback or uh, vote on features that we should work on. And uh, with that, I'll give it back to Daniel. Thank you, Brian. Um, so I'm going to go through this rather quickly. So you know, fairly early on, we decided that um, in, in conversations with people that uh, you know, there was a real rationale for not just doing all of this and then moving on to something else and letting all that data go away that we painstakingly put together, and, and in particular because archivists for years have been talking about w wanting to have the ability to do cooperative authority control and to share their work. So we thought, well, it, it, you know, this has been a good seed and foundation for that. Let's, you know, start seeing how we might do it. And the, the rationale for this um, is is really uh, e economic on one hand, and that you, you'll see when you go into Snack that you find, especially for the super connectors, the super nodes, that you know you'll have 35, 40, 50, 80 different biographical statements about someone when one would do, so if someone went in and just made a good biographical description, most everyone else would be content with it or might tweak it to add some detail. So there's an advantage there in, 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 in why that's possible is because of the way in which all of these documents are interrelated is 
one collection's creator uh, is is referenced in another collection. So all of the documents that archives have, in fact, blow through the boundaries of their archives and are interconnected to many other archives. <clears throat> and so what we have in mind doing here is really creating an international, internet-based, linked archival authority system, which is, you know, I think for anyone who knows what linked authority systems and will recognize that that's a non-trivial task and then you should wish us good luck. But I do think the technology is there to be able to do it and it's probably more of a social challenge than it is a technological challenge. For research users, the rationale for keeping this around and to you know, develop it, extend it, to add to it, to make it more comprehensive, is, is the integrated access to distributed historical resources. And we know from our own user studies and conversations with researchers that that, you know, I, you know one scholar exclaimed to me, you know, my gosh, I'm looking at two years of research presented to me on the screen. And that sort of research economy is extremely uh, appealing. And also the fact that it gives, for the first time, I'm trying to build these historical social networks. It's the kind of thing that historians do all the time and they painstakingly put it together. You're trying to see who's related to whom, who did they talk to, who are they influenced by, did they collaborate with that person? And we're surfacing that information and, and that's of extreme value to anyone doing historical research and trying to piece together you know, how something happened and who were the people involved and so on. <clears throat> So the strategy with respect to this is that we continue to use algorithms. Those would be Gesundheit. We continue to use algorithms, which is illustrated on the right side to sort of feed into this. This is supposed to be a cylinder into which we just keep pumping more and more identities. That shade gradient there is to say that at the bottom of that, that's sort of the under-identified, you know, who is that or is that even a person or not. And at the top of it, you have lots of evidence, you have lots of certainty, it's been human curated and verified. And so what we want to do is increase the volume of that cylinder, but also increasingly over time, having within it an expanding core of more and more verified and reliable identities. Um, I, I bring up um, the international standard name identifier .org, actually, is the, there is, uh, I've been very much in, influenced by discussions I've had with people involved with ISNI.org, but th this is a group of people who are, are really looking at identity reconciliation for public identities, for people, and not only within the cultural heritage sector, um, well, it still remains the cultural heritage sector, but not just the cultural heritage institutions, but also rights holders, publishers, uh, you know, managers of, of people's rights, some, you know, music industry, et cetera, so for artists, authors, et cetera, is that they really need a way of being able to identify all of these people and keep track of it. And so there's a collaboration going between the cultural heritage repository communities and these uh, 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 other entities that are in the sort of commercial private sector to collaborate on building reliable identities and the ability to reconcile against that. 
there is some similarity in what we're proposing for the cooperative in the way ISNI currently works, which is to say a combination of small, smart algorithms on one hand and smart people on the other. There are differences, though, in, this, in that ISNI really is cross-domain, but a lot of the major st stakeholders are interested in, in living people, or at least those people with which there are associated money issues, rights issues, but it also, it's not restricted historically because there are archives beginning to join isni.org and lots of, of libraries as well. And then I like to think of the, the archival domain overlaps considerably with these other domains, except for the fact that I've I've jokingly said that archives are interested in the long dead, the recently dead, and the nearly dead. And, and so a lot of what ISNI deals with may be people that will show up in archives but haven't shown up in there yet. So there is a sense of a continuum. So I would like to think that, that the cooperative could participate in ISNI at some point is to, to quote from one of the, the an ISNI presentation was to collaboratively consolidating identities at universal scale. <clears throat> so the, the next steps with respect to the cooperative is we've done a lot of planning. We have a proposal to the Mellon Foundation underway to launch a pilot phase of this, and, and this is still out, outstanding, so we'll, we'll find about, out about funding in June. Um, but in this proposal, the, the host will be the U.S. National Archives and Records Administration. They've gone through the, the legal work of establishing a, a, a charter to make sure that their participation as host in this falls within their legislated mandate at NARA, and they've assigned staff to work on this, and they're, they're pretty excited about all of this. The technology infrastructure, at least temporarily for the pilot phase, uh, will be hosted by uh, the University of Virginia, and we hope to launch this pilot in July of this year. The inaugural members of the cooperative, we kept this kind of small, uh, because we have a whole lot of issues to work through and getting really big too fast would make it really hard. So we have a fairly small number of keenly in interested, enthusiastic institutions involved. Um, and I, I think, you know, we don't have any state archives or historical societies, which is sort of a, a shame, but we've got two museum, one natural history and, and the Getty Research Institute, and the American Institute of Physics gives us a, a nice, interesting group. And then you can see there's a, a lot of august uh, places, or, or slightly maybe perhaps less august places, um, but still important. Um, and we've got the three biggies on the national scene, the Smithsonian, the National Archives, and the Library of Congress. It may be unprecedented that they've cooperated in this way before, so we're kind of excited about that. <clears throat> the inaugural director of this pilot phase will be Laura Campbell, who's the retired associate librarian, chief information officer of the Library of Congress, and she's in that role because she's done things like this at the Library of Congress, and she knows how to do them within a federal context, which has lots of challenges. And the deputy director of the cooperative will be John Martinez at NARA. <clears throat> Jerry Simmons at NARA will be in charge of the governance side of it and organizing that. Worthy Martin <clears throat> will be the technology lead at IF. And then there's a whole lot of other players involved. And so quickly closing thoughts on this. Um, <clears throat> I've discovered that uh, 
you know, trying to turn something that's R&D into a program, especially within the context of the federal government, is exceptionally complex uh, in multiple ways. And I think the most complex part of this is the social part, but I think that's probably true for all of us in most everything that we do, that they're, you know, intellectually and, and the technology is quite frequently there for things that we might want to do, but it's convincing other people to get on board and fund us and join in and agree to work with us is the most difficult challenge. Um, and in the end, what we hope that we'll do with this is, is, uh, is contribute a significant component to the international humanities research inf infrastructure and in build an, an international community of collaborating archives, libraries, and museums.